So, yeah, it's amazing to have you all back together again. I think it's been a couple of years since Ragged University last met because yeah. of the pandemic and everything else that's happened. Uh, so it's Fabio Savio. My name's James, and I work at the gallery as a curator. I've been here about 12 years, and we've collaborated a lot with Alex on the Ragged University events. Um, I don't, do you want to say a bit of something at the start, Alex? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it's lovely for this to be happening again. And uh, it's nice to see old faces and new faces. Um, and if, for those who don't know about the Ragged Uni idea, um, it came together 12 years ago when myself and a few friends down in London um, uh, took up the history of social education in Britain. So way back before there was any formal education, people in the communities banded together and shared their knowledge. A really beautiful history. Uh, for me, this, this is the path to follow, is uh, John Pounds. He was a crippled cobbler in Portsmouth. And he would go down the docks and he would give hot potatoes to, to the, the street urchins, the, the children who were running around, and he'd invite them back up to his cobbled, cobbler shop and he'd share his knowledge. And then one day, Charles Dickens heard about this. He wrote about this as a social practice. And then Thomas Guthrie over at the Greyfriars Kirk heard about it. And, and essentially, it grew as a notion of how to make a richer world. So me and a few friends thought, well, why not? We, we always meet. And we always carry on babbling about what we love. And I always learn a lot from friends and informal spaces. So finding people who love what they do to talk in social places like pubs, cafes, libraries, galleries, and learning and building off what happens here was the sort of crystal, chrysalis. 12 years later, like, and hundreds of events, like, it turns out that this, this is very popular. So now we're out of the, the, the strange period behind us and we're moving into the strange period ahead of us. <laughs> um, everybody's invited to share what they love doing as a part of Ragged Uni. It's informal, it's relaxed, it's scruffy. <laughs> 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 I'll bring the scruffy, you can bring the rest. <laughs> um, but um, hey, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to collaborate with other people? Like, so I've got collaborations with colleges and universities. Do you want to uh, get people involved in creative works you're doing? Um, what, the world is our oyster. And using the interstitial spaces the available infrastructure and common technology, we can do a lot. So I'll, I'll stop chuntering on now. Uh, I've, I've brought some biscuits for, for the break, and there's lovely coffee around the corner, and we're here to listen to, to James. So I've always enjoyed uh, the, the journeys you've taken me on and uh, learning from, from you. So cheers. Amazing. Well, thanks, Alex. And yeah, great to see, see everyone again. There's a few familiar faces here, but I think some people are maybe the first time with the Ragged University today as well. So just so, yeah, a quick bit of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce myself in the gallery properly. Um, you're going to be here for about an hour and a half. Uh, if you're on the loo while you're here, they're just behind us up the corridor here. Uh, you can also leave your bags and coats here. We're close to the public today. Um, so if you trust everybody in the room right now, then you can feel fairly safe with leaving your possessions at the door. Um, because of the nature of this exhibition and the fact that we weren't able to book other rooms, I've not been able to put on a lunch as we might do historically for these events. So I'm, I'm sorry that we're not able to provide much food today, but I, I know Alex has snacks with him and we might be able to add to that and get together in the quad after this. Unfortunately, we can't have food. Uh, in this spaces at this time. So, um, yeah, the uh, Talbot Rice Gallery is the contemporary art gallery for the University of Edinburgh. 
And all our exhibitions are free and open. So we really welcome you to come back time and time again to our gallery spaces. When I think of contemporary art, I think of artists that can deal with any subject under the sun. They could deal with comic books, they could deal with astrophysics, quantum science, they might deal with the history of slavery, they might deal with ecosystems, they can really draw upon anything. And I think their job is not just to show us new things, but to actually get us to look at those things in a different kind of way. And it really that's what today is about, is to use Celine Condorelli's exhibition as a way of thinking about how we look at the world in the first place, what goes into looking, and then use that to kind of broaden our approach to lots of different subjects. Now, I think one of the things that makes the gallery really unique is that because we're part of the University of Edinburgh, it's really easy for us to call upon amazing people across this community of researchers and scientists and students and get them to support the activities we do. And today is extra special because as well as the exhibition, we've also, you can see these blue tables dotted around. We've got a group of scientists with us who are going to also introduce us to the world through microscopes. And I might ask uh, Janet and everyone to say hello as well. So my name is Janet, and I'm from the School of Biology at University of Edinburgh. Me and my colleague Maria here. Our, our job in the school is in public engagement, i.e. we enable our researchers to um, communicate with audiences out with the university, we work with schools, we do science festivals, we do stuff in museums and things um, to that end. So later on, after we've had a wee tour, we'll come back here, and as James says, we've got these um, tables here, and we'll get hands-on, and we've got four PhD students here who are all working in different areas of biology, and they're really excited to be able to chat to you about what's on the tables and about the research, and to make links between what um, is on the tables and what we might see in the exhibition. So I guess that's part of the point as to, yeah, to see what we can get out of the exhibition and relate that to some hands-on science afterwards. So it's my job now to take you on a tour of the show. Um, this is a survey show by an artist called Celine Condorelli. There's loads and loads of stuff in this exhibition and I've got half an hour. So I'm going to have to be very selective um, and there'll be certain things that we'll just have to kind of glaze over and kind of a bridge. But I thought really my job today was to try and explain why we've decided to bring in microscopes into this particular exhibition. When we go next door, that'll be really obvious because the artist is drawing upon the natural world. The artist is looking at octopuses and cuttlefish and drawing inspiration from them. And we might also be inspired by the natural world around us. But what I wanted to do was also sort of tie in this side of the gallery and all the things that we'll see on the way to the exhibition next door uh, and try and make sense of it. Celine Candarelli is an artist who's often collaborating, and she tries to get us to think about support structures. So anything that supports us when we look at art. So for Celine, there's no such thing as just a neutral encounter with culture. There's always a lot of things going on behind the scenes that allow it to take place in the first instance. So I'm going to use like an obvious example of an artwork just to get us into thinking like Celine Candarelli. So let's take a history, a historical painting, something that we're all familiar with. You can imagine it how you want. It could be a landscape, it could be a cathedral, it could be a group of people gathering together. Um, but now, you know, if we ask, what is it that gives this artwork value? Does it have an inherent value? Is there something in it in itself that makes it valuable? Or is it the big gold frame that that painting's inside that makes it feel valuable? And you know, when you think of a historical painting, they're usually in a giant frame, aren't they? It'll be gold, it'll be ornate. And actually, one of the first legal cases in art was a case with Leonardo da Vinci, who tried to sue his patron, the person giving him money to make a painting, because that person paid the, the frame maker more money than they paid him. So it was an interesting time, because at that time, there wasn't a distinction between designers and artists. There's just one word, artificer, for both those crafts. And obviously, someone thought, well, actually, the frame is more important for this being valuable and creating an experience than the thing inside the frame. And, you know, we can really expand that. So think about the wall that our historical painting sits on. 
it's probably painted a certain color and that color is probably a heritage color. And what I mean by that is someone will have spent time researching the history of the building, the institution, and they'll have, they'll have picked a color that really evokes that. So suddenly we've got a historical wall that's tying our object into broader histories and broader movements. So people will pay attention to that in quite a different way. And of course, we know that a lot of these historical paintings exist inside institutions like the National Galleries that are a national collection. They're meant to say, oh, look, these are really important for the wealth of our country. So all of a sudden, we find there's all this thing happening around the painting. There's a security guard patrolling around. We know it's valuable. There's a sense of quiet as you go into a space. You shouldn't talk. You should look in a certain way. The seat in a certain distance from a painting so you can sit meditatively and look around and connect that painting to other paintings. So I guess this way of thinking, I, I'll call it today a sort of interconnected thinking. It's about showing the context in which things happen. And even if we just look at the canvas itself, like Alex said, you know, people are always getting together in different conversations to talk about things. That artist would have had those conversations. They would have gone to a certain school and learned how to paint certain techniques through a classical academy. Um, and they'd be using all kinds of techniques and technologies to make that painting. That might be a pinhole camera. It might be perspective. It might be a sort of classical history for if it's a history painting. They're using lots of pigments that people have researched and found and mined from other parts of the world. So all of a sudden that painting by that one individual artist turns out to be this huge collaboration across lots of different agents. And they're not just human agents either, they could be non-human agents. The technologies, the, the, um, the, the sort of support structures that allow that painting to come into being. So that, that's how Celine shifts our thinking, that when you encounter any artwork, there's all this huge apparatus around that that allows it to happen, and that actually shapes the way that you might think about it. So how does that link to the microscopes in here? Well, in that far corner, you won't see them from where we're standing right now, but you'll, there's a number of small gray rectangles in the images on the wall with the big green splodges on them. All those gray rectangles are photographs from the archive of the Museum of Modern Art. So that's a museum in New York that was set up to showcase uh, avant-garde American collections of art. And it was the first white cube kind of gallery that was invented. So it opened in 1929, and it was meant to be a laboratory for looking at artwork. So you wonder where all these white cube gallery spaces come from today. They come from that moment. So the idea of the white wall is that somehow it's neutral. And all the artworks in this gallery space, they're hung very differently from a historical gallery, where you might have a salon style hang everything all over. There's lots of space around all the artworks, time and space to meditate and maybe to think about the sort of truth that's being presented to you. There's this idea, this belief in a kind of aesthetic truth when you look at a Rothko painting. All the windows would have had blinds over them. Um, and one of the connections here is that a lot of modern art tried to hide nature. It tried to move away from it to create these universal sort of inside experiences. There's these sort of stories that might be mythical, but of uh, Piet Mondrian, the famous Dutch artist, whose paintings you will recognize from all kinds of merchandise these days, <laughs> but with big, bold, colorful squares and big, bold lines. But the story was that whenever he would go on a train, he would pull the blinds down because he wanted to appreciate the modern design of the interior of the train. And he didn't want nature interfering into that. <laughs> now, you might believe or not believe that story, but I think some of that is very true to the history of modern art. It worked to the exclusion of all these external factors. It excluded so many things. It excluded people's bodies. So when you go into this laboratory for looking, uh, you're meant to do so as this kind of universal eye who's going to appraise the painting's value forever. You're not really there as a kind of someone with your own opinions and your own life. Uh, and your own being. And that's something that Celine tries to, to turn around, to shift the situation. What she found really interesting looking at these archive photos is that despite all that, most of them have plants in them. Now those plants are obviously playing some role. They're a kind of agent in people looking at art in the Museum of Modern Art, but they're never labeled, they're never acknowledged. 
And that's what Selena's pointing to. So now as you turn around into this exhibition, you can see that Selena's brought them back. And she's researched where these plants come from, like the philodendron. You see with the heart shaved leaves, uh, philo meaning love. Uh, this is the lover of trees. And all these plants in, in this museum have different histories, colonial histories. They come from somewhere. They have certain meanings, certain mythologies attached to them. So that's often what Celine is doing. She's turning our attention to all the things that support an artwork to come into being. And that's why her art can take the form of a curtain that divides a space or a shelf or a seating apparatus or a sunshade. That's why she considers opening all the windows in this gallery to be an artwork in its own right. So she's reversing some of that history of the, the museum that shuts nature outside. And I think that's the sort of first big step towards us realizing why it leads naturally to us kind of looking at the, the world around us in more detail. Okay, so that's the kind of introduction to get us into thinking like Celine. I'm going to take us on a walk through the spaces now. Uh, and we'll, we'll really stop next door, but I'll just, I'll point a few things out as we go. Uh, you can interrupt me at any time. I love heckles and jokes and thoughts. So if you wanted to shout things at me, please go ahead as we go. Maybe as we walk through the next space, just, just think about how this room makes you feel as well. That's really important to what art does. How do you feel in this space and how does that contrast to the room we're going to go into next? Okay, we're going to have to come right into this, this fairly small room. Here's the point we said the logic is that there's still security guards and nothing to blame for. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. I'll, I'll have to address that now. Yeah, please do come in. Yeah, I was, when I gave our example of a history painting, I said that having a security guard round gave value to the artworks. I'm the security guard today, uh, and I look to you all to help us look after these artworks as we move around. Um, but yeah, that, that was a, quite a specific example. But you've probably, I mean, you're probably, now your eyes are adjusting. I'm sure uh, you might sense even a change in like temperature of tone. It's such a different space, isn't it, walking through here? And it, I think what's important about Celine's practice is it tries to be present. It tries to work in, in terms of real experience. And through there, that was a space that's about gardening, leisure time, holidays, deck chairs. That's a space for leisure. And of course, going to museums is a leisure activity. This space is about factory work and labor. So the works in this room were made inside a Pirelli tire factory. Pirelli sponsor a really large art gallery in Italy called Hanna Bacocca. And Celine got to spend quite a lot of time in this factory, working a, a bit like an ethnographer, collecting as much data as she could, finding things on the factory floor, talking to the workers, assembling them together. And, you know, what, what this shows us is that Celine's thinking about this kind of interconnectedness of everything through all her practice. So some of the records of the Pirelli Tire Factory talk about the plantations that they had to set up to grow the rubber to make these, these tires. And obviously that has a huge impact on indigenous communities who might be moved out um, of a particular area in order to mass produce these materials for our factory systems. So really colonial history. She also found out magazines about the workers who would, uh, you know, collect together, who would form communities, a celebration when they introduced air conditioning into this factory space. And I think for Celine, the, the crowning moment was when she managed to convince Pirelli to stop production of their tires for a whole day and instead produce something for her. <laughs> so this artwork is called Cotton Rubber. They're the two main ingredients in a tire. The most of the tires we know have rubber on the outside and the cotton's hidden on the inside. The images behind you here are, are fingerprints of the tire that Celine made. And you can see they've been reversed. So instead of having the usual standard tread, 
all these kind of cables and fibers are pushed to the outside. And I think that's, that's a nice, sort of simple way of, again, just thinking about what Celine is generally trying to do here. She's taken all this work of these hundreds and hundreds of people in this factory, and through this intervention, she sort of turned it inside out so we can see all this hidden labor uh, that goes on behind the tires, which then, of course, make their way around the world and leave their tracks behind. Okay, we'll keep moving. We'll head upstairs. Again, another dark space with some noise. going to turn the sound off this, which is an awful thing to do to the film, um, but just for the purpose of this talk. So this film is called After Work, and it gives this title to the whole exhibition. I'm sure you can start to see why it's an appropriate title for an exhibition that's about labour and leisure, um, because, you know, in a way this is about what do you do after work, what happens in that other period. And for Celine, labour and leisure are very much tied together. It's because people fought in the factories and uh, formed unions that, you know, we have weekends, we have more leisure time. It's the kind of, the two things are conjoined. And through this video, she is trying to get us to think about, again, how our encounters with culture always come from all this hidden labor. So when we go to a playground, we don't often think about where that comes from. This film, which was made in collaboration with Ben Rivers, who it's a filmmaker who works a bit like an anthropologist. He often just goes somewhere and then trains his camera on it and watches what happens. But it shows us the, the stones being quarried. It shows us the concrete being poured. It shows us the metal being milled. Everything that goes into making this playground environment. The, the playground is a real playground. Um, it's made for Elmington Estate in London. Some of you might have noticed downstairs, but we've got some beautiful coloured spinning tops. They're actually scale models of full-size uh, roundabouts that children could play on. And play's got an interesting role in this exhibition. I think Celine is very critical of modern architects who might try and prescribe how people should occupy a space, saying, OK, I'm going to make this building, people will live in it just like this, just like I say. But when you design for play, you're doing something else like successful plays when all the users, all the children, can come and bring their own interpretations and their own games to a space. And I love that shift in this exhibition from abstract art, like in MoMA, where it's this holier-than-thou, untouchable thing, to abstract art, which is an art that leaves a lot for the imagination. Celine calls her playgrounds tools for the imagination. 
And I think that's a really beautiful sort of title and evocative. Uh, the other collaborator here is Gia Bernard, who's a poet who grew up around the Elmington estate. And the poem, if you spent more time with this film, it talks about everyone who might appropriate a playground. So they're not just utopian sites either, there can be spaces of coming to age, awkwardness, policing, mischief, fireworks. Uh, also you've seen here, Salim was really interested to make sure like other things start to use a playground space as well. So there's cats and foxes and dogs, all these other things being invited into it. And it, I think again that's because this is an artwork that's present. When you make a playground, <coughs> It's sighted in a, in, a, in a space, and then it can be used. This isn't coming from an abstract idea, it's a physical intervention into a, a public space. Okay, I think I'm probably going a bit too slow, but we're going to now move through the sunlight again. If you've got sunglasses with you, it's a good time to put them back on. Uh, and I'll just chat to you before we go into the Georgia Gallery. pack in here and enjoy the post-COVID freedoms that we have these days. It's all novel now. It's all, yeah, I remember that. Oh. So we're, we're obviously missing a lot out as we go through this tour. You probably just saw all the lines on the walls there that speak of like different sporting activities like badminton, uh, racket sports, football. Each of those lines has a date on it, and that's the date at which women were first allowed to, to play those sports uh, professionally in France. So there's a lot of politics underlying this exhibition as well. Celine is saying no encounter with culture is natural, and she's pointing out that there are all kinds of rules and things that affect who can engage with what kind of object and what they might take from that. Um, we're going to now head into the Georgian Gallery. It's very noisy in there, so rather than turn the sound off, what I'd like to do is, is sort of tell you a bit about the work first and then just let you immerse yourself in this kind of other environment for a while. The installation through there is called Thinking Through Skin and it was developed for an exhibition in Nottingham that tried to project about 70 years into the future, the idea being that's about a generation of time. Uh, so Salim was, was briefed to try and imagine what changes might take place in 70 years and she took inspiration from uh, the Keflopod family, which is octopuses and cuttlefish. Uh, there's lots of great films now about octopuses. You might have seen on Netflix, I think it's called My Octopus Love. Um, My Octopus Teacher? My Octopus Teacher. Yeah, sorry, I made that sound. That's another channel. Uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> God, that's very revealing, wasn't it? Freudian slip. Uh, yes, My Octopus Teacher on Netflix, the uh, general one, yeah. So, um, I mean, they're amazing creatures, they can sort of turn into liquid, they can go solid, um, they can change colour, they can change shape. Um, and also they've got this kind of distributed brain, they're this sort of very spontaneous, responsive creature. And Celine talks about them as this kind of technology. They evolved like hundreds of millions of years ago. So they're a really sustainable technology. I'm not sure if humankind will last 70 years, but like octopuses <laughs> definitely will. They're kind of pioneers in that sense. So the room next door is, is it takes their lead and it takes us into a very fluid kind of reality. I think throughout this exhibition, there's a, a critique about how the modern world often looks at things, often looks at things by separating them into different categories. If you think of a fundamental thing like color, for example, when we print things, we're often using CMYK or RGB, other color combinations to represent different things. But this space is, is inspired by early synthetic color experiments where the chemicals are doing their own thing, they're being present. They're not trying to pretend to be any other color. 
And a lot of the shapes we see through here uh, uses uh, those early color experiments and then uh, a computer system to try and look at them through the skin of an octopus. So it's a very different kind of space. Uh, and you can hear already it's, it's a bit like a science fiction in that it's asking us to project all these uh, other ideas into the future. So we'll head through, we'll be walking around the balcony. Uh, there's then a spiral staircase at the other side. If anyone's got any difficulties, I can help you down in the lift instead. Otherwise, we'll meet downstairs in about four or five minutes and have another chat in this space. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, we've had to turn off the soundtrack again, um, just so that you can hear me relatively easily. So yeah, this brings us through to the, the installation that I've described to you. Um, and there's lots of different elements in here. Celine is always collaborating, and as you can imagine, she makes sure it's very clear that all artworks come from some kind of collaboration. Here we've got a lot of uh, artworks by other artists that explore different subjects and ideas. Uh, there's a strange painting that you'll pass on the way out that's called Blue Roan. And Blue Roan is the name of the colour of horse hair. What's strange about this painting is that it is the horse. So this is a painting where a horse's ashes were sprayed onto the surface of a canvas. So we're not looking at a representation of a horse. That is the horse. By the way, the horse was dead before the artwork was conceived. It wasn't, wasn't destroyed just for that one artwork. It was a racehorse, um, and the artists were, were experimenting with what it means to present something rather than represent something. The work on my left here is another film by Ben Rivers. It's shot inside this laboratory in the Arizona desert, where they try to experiment with uh, creating a separate, insulated type of environment. Uh, you'll probably see little clips of it um, at times, it looks like this big kind of greenhouse, this sort of triangular prism. The soundtrack to this is uh, another sort of science fiction, and it imagines the last survivor in this, this space. And day by day, day, you hear about them running out of food and running out of oxygen. It becomes quite claustrophobic. But I think this is a sort of moral lesson that, that Celine's chosen to introduce here about the problems that we might encounter if we think into the future, but we don't connect those thoughts to the ecosystem that really sustains us. So throughout this talk, I've tried to, um, I guess, take us into Celine's practice and show, show that even though this is really eclectic and we go from one very different space into another, throughout Celine's practice, there's always this focus on making connections and joining the dots that I think makes it quite natural that she would turn towards 
ecosystems and the living world around us. So I think at this point I've realized I've run out of, out of time quite a lot, but I'm going to invite some of our um, friends from the School of Biology to maybe sort of join us and we'll just take five or ten minutes to reflect on the exhibition um, and some of the thoughts it's generated and then we'll head back into the sunshine and look at some of these biological specimens. Well, I don't know if to kick us off anyone has any thoughts or questions. That's a lot of information in a short space of time. I said anything about fungi. <laughs> um, because that's a, an important part of nature. The decay of nature. You need to decay nature before you can get a regeneration, regrowth. Yeah, fungi is amazing, isn't it? The way it collaborates with trees and it sends messages on the ground. People call it like the wood wide web um, in the way it sort of connects information. Um, specifically, we don't have much about fungi in this show. We did an exhibition with Angelica Masiti that had a whole garden that was emphasizing fungi and how it connects things underground. Um, but yeah, unless there's something growing in the space I don't know about, there's not a lot here just now. I was interested in the virtual reality and the way that the, the information, the words were presented on the screen, very similar to a computer game where there is a whole virtual playground rather than the physical. There's, there's more than one element to a playground and, and worlds in the head and where information is presented in exactly the same way on a screen separately. Yeah, that's a lovely point. Yeah, so when we're upstairs, we've put J. Bernard's poem as a separate screen, as captions, because Celine doesn't want to put captions over Ben Rivers' film, so we had them as a separate thing to help access. But yeah, that's a really interesting point, is that, you know, that maybe we shouldn't be too quick to say, well, this is reality and this is, uh, this is imma immateriality. Yeah, maybe the two things sort of intersect and... I guess it's a bit like the, there's this sort of theory of object-orientated ontology that's quite popular at the moment. But um, the author of that, Graham Harmon, really argues that we have to account for things that are fictions, fantasies, that have an impact on the real world as well. I like think of Sherlock Holmes as one example they give. You know, the, the culture of Sherlock Holmes has affected the economy. It's affected people's movements in London as they track down where that fictional character might have gone. So yeah, I think we should be careful about where reality and irreality uh, kind of sit side by side. And maybe throughout the show as well, I, I do think Celine is sceptical of things that are natural and things that are synthetic. You probably notice all the rocks next door. They're genuine rocks. Uh, they're granites from outside Edinburgh College of Art where you cut them from lumps that are about this size. And they're, they're real genuine rocks, but they've been painted to look synthetic. Um, I mean, you could play a joke on someone by saying, oh, that's polystyrene, give it a good kick. Um, and they would uh, not appreciate the gag, I don't think. But yeah, the, the, I think there's that play throughout here of things are inter interacting so much that it's actually not so easy to say where things are natural and, and unnatural anymore. The curtain's sort of moving here. Maybe this is a signal for us to start to... Uh, move next door. I think it's great. This is such a performative space. It's, it's choreographed. It has different light effects. And just quickly to recall what we were saying about modern art and some of its origins. This really reminds me that a lot of modern art was based around the repression of things that were theatrical and performative. The art critics, the big American art critics of that time, thought that was really vulgar and it shouldn't have been part of art. Because you're there to have this aesthetic contemplative relationship. But of course, Celine is here to emphasize the performance. She's here to emphasize an artwork that affects us directly through our bodies and through the environments we move through as we enjoy this artwork. There's not some kind of ideal universal principle we're gonna get from it. We're just gonna have to live among this artwork and, and start to interpret it ourselves. <laughs> So I wonder now if we should move back into the light and then we can see each other a bit better again and um, we can introduce uh, the next part of the session. <coughs> so
So, Janet, you want me to call people together to start with? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, folks, all just quickly get together and then you'll be able to go and explore the different workstations in the space. We've got a fix. I think we've got everyone. I'll go and have a sweet round. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so we've got about 40 minutes or something, I think, to spend here in this space again. So what we're going to do is, or what you are going to do, is get a bit more hands-on um, and explore maybe the themes that have come out of the exhibition in connection with some science, some biology. So we've got three stations here. And they are going to be facilitated by our research scientists or PhD students. They're all working on different things and they'll be able to introduce themselves and tell you about what they're working on um, when you see them. Um, I suppose for me, the links, I mean, there's this overarching link between biology and the exhibition for me. And that's this, you know, what we've touched on already, this business of things connecting lots of things collaborating to you know to make something bigger and you know for me that's like biodiversity that's ecosystems it's also science more generally you know in that these days scientific discoveries are a result of lots of different scientists collaborating sometimes from all over the world together so there's lots of connections we can make and um, so that's just something to think about um, what you, get, what you think you've got out of the exhibition and how you might connect it to, um, to science more widely. Okay, I'll stop talking now and we'll split you into groups, or rather, can I ask you maybe you to kind of split yourselves into groups? I think roughly five or six people per table. What we will do is you'll spend about 10 minutes at that table and then you'll rotate to the next table. So we'll go in a clockwise direction eventually. So if you were there, you would go there and then eventually you would go there. But if you can kind of herd yourselves, pick a table and we'll try and get about five or six people per table. Workstation number three. <laughs> Come in, please. Your time is up. <laughs> okay, so we'll ignore them. They're ignoring us. That's okay. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for coming back into the gallery. Uh, it's really amazing to be working with Ragged University again. I hope we can do this for all our exhibitions, so um, keep a, a check on that. Um, just to give you a quick sense of the next show, so I think you'll find interesting as well. This space is going to have a momentary mon monument in it. That's a momentary monument. It's a bit of a tongue twister. But it's going to be a library of books that people are invited to come and leaf through, and then they can take a book away with them. And the artwork is hidden inside the book. These are all books that were going to be destroyed, so in a way the artist's work has saved them. And because people take away the books, the exhibition is going to become more and more empty until it's in nothing. So it's quite an interesting play on what it means to have monuments. So that's Lara Favoretto, an Italian artist. So that's going to be at the end of October. So this year runs until the 1st, and then we've got three exhibitions opening. So there's Lara Favoretto. Upstairs we've got Nira Pereg, who's an Israeli artist who has made films in this space called The Cave of the Patriarchs. And it's the only space in the world where Jewish and Muslim practitioners share a place of worship. It's incredibly militarized and policed so that they don't come into contact. And in this film, we watch different worshippers move in and out of the spaces, having to transform them to change it from a synagogue to a mosque and back again to different times of the place? year. So it's called the Cave of the Patriarchs. And where is it? Um, so it's in the occupied territories of Palestine. So quite a troubled area of the world. Which, and this... which, which, which occupied? Sorry, which occupied area? So um, I'm trying to remember the city off the top of my head. Okay. Um, Don't Hebron, it's in Hebron. Hebron. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, we've got a Chinese artist called Xiu Xu Xie, who's going to have his uh, map works next door as well. Uh, he's an artist who has practiced a lot of traditional crafts. So he's a master calligrapher and painter. Um, but his, his artworks are all about trying to get rid of what we assume to know and then remake things in a way that we can navigate fresh. So lots of interesting things at the end of October and we'll put a signpost out to bring people together again. I think today it's been amazing to have everyone from the School of Biology helping us out. But maybe we should give them a round of applause for all that.
But yeah, I think as always, we're probably going to have to draw the session to an end. It's been fabulous having everyone here. Um, I'm going to sense check the feeling in the room, but I wonder because it's the first time you've all got together in so long, should we have a group photograph? Yeah. 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 We could all stand together with this nice yellow <laughs> lemon bin on But without the script. <laughs> yeah. You can Photoshop me out, actually. Yeah. The, the beauty of it all. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can have the yellow lemon as the backdrop. If we're, anyone who wants to be in the group of photographs, come together. Oh, no, why are you going to Well, it would be nice to be able to use the gold lines. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, so we're going to have a big smile. So, one, two, three. Yay, right <laughs> Thank you, James. Uh, uh, I, I checked with James earlier, and uh, anybody who would like to join me for chocolates and biscuits uh, out in the quad, there's also a really nice coffee shop. So if, if anybody wants a, 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 a snack, <laughs> it's lovely to see you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if anybody doesn't know about the meetup group, you can join the meetup group or uh, go on the website and uh, be on the mailing list. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.